Hey everybody, Father Dave. <clears throat> Excuse me, we got crags back there. We are at the uh, inlet. Can I flip this around? Is that going to... Uh, no, so I'm using my telephone, so I got to turn the camera around like that. I hope you can see all that. Beautiful. Come here usually uh, on Thursday mornings um, and start my homily prep. Pork, leg, and cheese and a cup of coffee. My girl gets the eggs. And then she goes, she takes a little break. So uh, yesterday was Ash Wednesday. Did you get your ashes? Did it affect you? So a friend of mine reached out and said, Father Dave, are you putting your homily online? I respect her, so I'm throwing it up there for you guys. Um, hopefully you heard something good last night and you made it to midnight. Um, and welcome to the Subaru. <laughs> I, love, I love my Subaru. Welcome. All right, so Ash Wednesday. You know, one of the things that you heard Jesus say in that gospel was, what you know when uh, when you pray when you fast when you give alms and we know that and then he says your father who sees in secret will repay you all right so in the nfl football teams i wish i could give you a view of the water i, I guess i can kind of do that but it's not the same and you can't back in here here's so you got to pull them straight all right so football teams do they make halftime adjustments in the nfl yes or no say yes yeah of course they do and well what do they do with the halftime adjustments do they look at how they're playing yeah, of course. But if we want to actually be forthright, like what they do is they don't only look at how they're playing. They go back to remember their game plan. They go back to the beginning. Like, well, how did they, you know, how did, how are they going to beat a team? Right. And like, <clears throat> I had some fun with the Jet fans and the Viking fans in the parish. Right. So like, does every team make halftime adjustments? Yes or no? Say no. <laughs> right. Because the Jets don't do it. You know, my poor father loves the Jets. My best friend loves the Jets. I like the Jets. They're my second team. And they never make halftime adjustments because they always end up losing. And neither do the Vikings, right? What are the Viking? Like I ask my most of my people here are Giant fans, and so I say, like, yeah, you know, what do Giant? Fan, what do Giants have to? What do the Giants have to do to beat the Vikings? Nothing, because <laughs> we're not going to make any adjustments, but they will, right? So it's frustrating. But what do they do? Is they don't just look at how are they performing in the field. They actually have to remember the four things they have to know. Right in their game plan, right? They want to win on offense. They want to win on defense. They want to win on special teams, and they want to win the the turnover battle. And any reporter, it's I mean, it's so boring. Like sports reporters, what do they ask every coach before every game? How are you going to beat that other team? Well, we're going to win on offense, and we're going to win on defense, and we're going to win on special teams. We got to win, you know, control the turnover battle. Everybody says that, but those four categories then break down into subcategories, right? So then, how do you win on offense? Right, and that may mean we got to run the ball really well. I mean, we got to block, you know, we got to protect our quarterback so that, you know, he has time to pass the ball and doesn't like throw short of the line of gain, like fourth down and eight, and he throws for three yards. Ridiculous. No one would ever do that if they're a professional quarterback and playing in the, in the league for like almost 10 years. I'm sure no one would do that. I'm still bitter about that, Kirk Cousins. I'm still bitter about that. You know better than that. But then I got to think of my own sins because, you know, I still sin and I know better than that too. And hopefully no chips. No chips, no pizza for Lent. But you can have what you gave up on Lent on Sunday. So that's good news. That's good news for her, too. All right, because, all right, let's keep going. So all those categories, you can break down the offense. And then when the coach gets the whole team together, this is what he's telling them at the halftime adjustments, right? He's, he's bringing the whole team together. But then eat that what the whole team has to do is then carry out what each individual on that team actually has to do, right? So, like, if you're a wide receiver... Well, you got to win an offense. Well, what does that mean for you? Do you have to block? Do you have to run your route? Do you have to fake it? Do you have to do an end around? Like, it depends on what your position is, right? All right. So Lent and Ash Wednesday particularly is like our halftime adjustment, where we as a Catholic people, like the coach, Jesus, he gets the whole team together, right? And we say, hey, uh, how are we doing? Are we winning? Could we do better? And I think as a whole, the Catholic people, yeah, we could do better. Every year of our life, we could do better. As a whole, Catholics, you know, we could be better, Right? So how do we get better? I remember, you know, we're looking at those four things. We gotta win on offense, we gotta win on defense, we gotta win on special teams, we gotta not turn the ball over. And you may think, well, you know, what does that what does that mean for us and for each of us? Well, so what did God make you? Right? The old Baltimore catechism, very simple questions, giving you answers that then you can unpack. Like you have to what does it mean to win an offense? You have to unpack that. What does it mean to win if you're a lineman on offense? You have to unpack that. So we expand these out like, you know, like Russian nesting dolls. You know, there's some other stuff inside there as we knuckle down. So for us, you know, look at our halftime adjustments as a team and as a people, as Catholics. So 
Why did God make you? The old catechism, Baltimore Catechism, right? And some of you were alive when that was written back in the 1700s. No, <laughs> right? But uh, um, anyway, why did God make you? He made you to what? To know him, to love him, to serve him, and to be happy with him forever in heaven. To know him, love him, serve him, and be happy with him forever in heaven. And you could break each one of those out and expand those, right? So what does it mean, the second one, for example? What does it mean to love God? She's cutie. What it means to love God? Well, Jesus tells us, right? You got to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, right? He literally says, what does it mean to love God? He says, um, you know, keep my, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says, you can't love a God you don't see if you fail to love the neighbor that you do see. We got to love the people around us, right? So do you have to love people on the other side of the world? Yes or no? Say no. I mean, you do love them in a general sense, but like, you know, unless they're in your neighborhood, unless you interact with them on a daily basis, you're not called to love them. I mean, yeah, if you hear on the news that there's, a, you know, fighting in Af you know, Afghanistan or fighting in the Ukraine, many of us have given money to help, you know, to help the people over there. Um, all right, great. But you got to love the people around you. Love God and love your neighbor. And that's how you love God. It's Your love of God is carried out in your love of neighbor. You can't, again, Jesus' words, not mine, I follow him. You can't love a God you don't see if you fail to love the neighbor that you do see, right? So, be a good Samaritan to whoever you come upon. All right, and that breaks out. So like, do you love your mother-in-law? Be honest. Right now you're clicking away from the video. <laughs> I don't have mother-in-laws, so I can keep making these comments and these jokes. Right, do you love, you know, do you love your boss, right? Do you love your parish priest, right? Whoever he is, right? Do you love the people around you when you're driving? Do you love the people around you? Right, you see how each of that, like, there's the rule, love God, love your neighbor. That's, you know, we got to win on offense. Well, how do you do that? You got to break it down. You got to love your neighbors. Right? You got to love God. All right. Uh, to know God, to love God, to serve God. If we look at serving of God, right, you can break that down into, like, how are you doing? Here's your halftime adjustments. How are you doing serving God? How we serve God is based on our vows, right, our relationships, right? So if you're a priest, right, watching this, God bless your father, persevere, don't give up, right? Like, Put up with those parishioners. God bless them. They're annoying at times, but we got to love them because they're we're shepherds. We got to care for them, right? But like, and if you're not a priest, you could be annoying at times, right? I mean, we could be annoying to you guys too, right? You know, oh, father's going for long today and we need to get the kids to whatever, track practice or something. Or we're going to grandma's and father's preaching too long. I'll watch the homily after the day after Ash Wednesday. But like, I'm going longer today than I did yesterday because I'm in my car. I had a pork leg and cheese, a cup of coffee. And my beautiful girl back there. All right. So serving God is based on your vocation. If you're a husband or wife, how do you you're called to serve God by loving your spouse and honoring your spouse and obeying your spouse and caring for your spouse in good times and bad and sickness and health, right? Um, in riches and poverty, all the days of your life. And sometimes you have to. Sometimes divorce is a necessary thing, right? This is not that conversation, but sometimes that's necessary. But but even if that if that's the case, right? And, and you get your annulment, or maybe you don't have the annulment yet. Oh, here's a cool boat coming. Hold on. Squirrel. <laughs> the gambler. You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Know when to walk away and know when to run and know when to get on the gambler fishing dot net boat to go out there to catch some, uh, whatever they're catching today. Stripers. I'm not sure what they're catching. Fluke. I'm a freshwater fisherman and a hunter. I don't fish in the salt water. You got a choice in Jersey. We got some beautiful, we got some beautiful woods. We got very tiny mountains. We got the sea. We got lakes. Anyway, back to serving God. Right. If you call, if you're, you know, if you're married as a fisherman, you got to love your marriage more than your fishing. Right. Let's go to that. Did I finish up the part on divorce? I'm forgetting. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Talk about your spouse, like your spouse. Like, all right. So if you're divorced, do you talk bad about your spouse to your kids? Because you shouldn't do that. Right. There's a time in their life. I think we said this in one of the other videos. There's a time in your life, in their life, when you have to tell them, you know, what happened so that they can make good, wise adult decisions. But you don't tear down your ex in front of your kids that's not that's because whoever he or she is that's their parents too right and like well they're doing that about me father dave oh yeah well jesus says do unto others what you want them to do to you not what they are doing to you right you you don't find jesus like spitting and whipping people from the cross right he's enduring it and saying father forgive me they don't know what they're doing that's tough father dave i'm clicking away click away god bless you good luck <laughs> no, like i'm trying to help you all all right let's keep going so like as a priest, the way I serve God is different than you guys, right? A deacon, different than you guys. A nun, a hermit, right? A consecrated virgin, right? I mean, if you're not married, the way you serve God is different than if you're married. <clears throat> Remember that song, Cats in the Cradle, right? That guy's always so busy, right? He's too busy for his family, 
And it's a sad song. I hate that song. Right? Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon. And then what happens when his kid, when he wants his kids, well, they're too busy for him. Or right? if you're putting your job over your marriage, you're putting things in the wrong order. And for parents, you know, we talk about this a lot on this channel because it's from the God, it's from the Lord. You know, you can find it in Ephesians. If you put your kids above your marriage, they're in the wrong place. You got to put your marriage above your children. That's another conversation. Anyway, so that's how you serve God. You can break that out and then you say, how am I doing as a husband, as a wife? If I'm still angry at my spouse over something they did two weeks ago, that is on you. Not them anymore. That's on you. You got to love them because God's going to ask you, how have you been? Be vowed and living out those vows, right? And since, on, this, since this is on the internet, I'll say a couple things here, right? So many men get trapped into looking at bad stuff on the internet. You're dishonoring your marriage vows right there. That's not serving your wife well. Many women get into all kinds of like reading bad, you know, smutty novels and stuff like that. You're not honoring your marriage right there. Get right. Serve your God by serving your spouse. Right? The greatest in the kingdom or the least. All right, let's keep going. Uh, so you can break out love of God, serve of God, and being happy with him in heaven is a great one to break out. But, um... We actually can't do that here, so we'll do that later. I'll see you in heaven for the advanced class if I get there. I'm hoping I will. All right, my arm's getting tired. So let's uh, roll over here. All right. So about that first one? You know, the Catholic Church says there are four things you need to know to be saved. Right? If you ask Jesus, what must I do to be saved? He says, keep the commandments. Right? That's what he says to the rich young man. You know, the people ask him, what, am I, what do I have to do to be saved? What are the greatest commandments then? And Jesus will say, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. All right. What does it mean to know God? The Catholic Church will say there are four things you need to know to be saved. So what are they? One, and they're related to the numbers, at least to how I remember them, are related to numbers. So one, what must you know to be saved? There is only one God. Right? If we're breaking down the game plan, because the NFL players don't even just they don't just look at halftime. What do they have to do? They're remembering the game plan, and then what does that mean for them? So one, the first thing there's four things you need to know to be saved. The first, there is only one God. That's related to the number one, because there's only one God. Well, how does that relate to my behavior? Well, have I tried to make other things God in my life? Is God the God of my life? Do I obey him and his commandments? Or do I have ask him to follow me? Like, oh, on Sunday, Father Dave, I'm not going to go to church. I'm going to go to the inlet. And I'm going to pray out here, looking at the water, have a pork with egg and cheese, read the paper, surf the internet. And that's how I keep Sunday holy. Yeah. I don't find Jesus saying that in the Bible. I find Jesus saying, do this in memory of me. And I find the Father saying, whoever honors the Son will be honored by the Father. Jesus says, whoever denies me, I will deny him. Whoever acknowledges me, I will acknowledge him. How do we acknowledge Jesus? By keeping his commandments. So there's that question. First thing you need to know to be saved, there is only one God. Second, second thing you need to be saved. Second thing is related to the number two. There are two qualities to God. Two qualities to God. So one, there is only one God. Two, God is supremely just. He rewards the good and punishes evil. Two, God is supremely just. He rewards the good and punishes evil. Well, if God does that, how am I doing with good and evil? Do I do good? Do I do evil? God rewards the good and punishes the evil. Huh. What does that mean for me if I'm on the offense, the defense, the special teams, and the turnover battle? Let's keep going. What was the one? There is two. God is. Right, what am I doing here? I'm hoping you're filling in the blanks that we did yesterday at the parish. Right. The third thing. In God, there are three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. There is only one God. He is supremely good. He rewards the good and punishes evil. In God, there are three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll talk about the Trinity on Trinity Sunday a little bit later in the year. We've talked about it in the past. But how is that important for my behavior? Well, it's important because how are my relationships with God? Right? How's my relationship? Do I like? Do I love him? Am I growing in love of him? How are my relationships? Am I putting them into effect in my life with him? Do I bring those relationships around me to God, to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Right? It's important. Because God doesn't simply just want robots. He wants a relationship with you. Are you looking to have one with him? That's related back to the one. There is only one God. Two, God is supremely just. He rewards the good and which is evil. Right. Three, in God there are three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right, what's the fourth thing you have to know to be saved? 
The fourth thing you have to know to be saved is what? Is the fourth thing you have to know to be saved. The second person of the Trinity became man for us, suffered for us, died for us, and rose for us. There are four points of the fourth thing you need to know to be saved. What are they again? The second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity became man for us, suffered for us, died for us, and rose for us so that we might be saved. The second person of the Trinity became man for us, suffered for us, died for us, and rose for us so that we might be saved. You ready? What's the one thing you need to know to be saved? And the two. And the three. What's the fourth thing you need to know to be saved? This is the test. The second person of the Trinity became man for us, suffered for us, died for us, and rose for us so that we might be saved. All right, why do we go and uh, why do we need to know that? I'll get to that. So I did this for Ash Wednesday, and the parish did great until the fourth one, and then they just couldn't get it. It was like, let's do it again and again and again. And they're like, ah, fire Dave. No, we got to know it. We got to do it. So why? So we put ashes on because... Well, we're made from, we put ashes on the forehead. We say, remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Right? So, like a team at the halftime adjustment, we're going back to the beginning. We also think about the end on Ash Wednesday, and this is like how, how it is, and all this is supported and connected. So, we put ashes on our head because we're going to go back to dust because we're going to die one day. Right? So, imagine, imagine, like you had that in your head. Imagine that you heard from God that today's the last day of your, your life. You know, when the clock strikes midnight, you're dying. So what would you do? If you know that you're going to die tonight, right? Pagans, they're going to be like, I'm going to eat and drink and be merry. I'm going to have more purple egg and cheese. I'm going to have more coffee. Uh, you know, I'm going to do all I can because tomorrow we die. That's what pagans would say. That's not what Jews would do. That's not what Muslims, or I'm not sure. I don't know about, enough about Islam, but that's not what Jews would do. That's not what Christians do. What would we do? Well, if we know that God is supremely just, let's back up. If we know that there's only one God, and that God is supremely just, and He rewards good and punishes evil, and that in God, the, in God there are three persons: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that the second person of the Trinity became man for us, suffered for us, died for us, and rose for us, so that we'd be saved. If we know all of that, and that we're going to stand before the only God, who is supremely just, who rewards good and punishes evil. We're going to stand before the, th in God, there are three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that second person of the Trinity became man for us, suffered for us, died for us, and rose for us, and we'd be saved. If we're going to see him at midnight, because we're going to die at midnight, then we would spend today differently. We wouldn't just, like, try to gorge ourselves and, like, try to have all the experiences we can while the top, before the clock runs out. Like, uh, the player in the NFL, right? You may only have one more play in the third quarter, you don't know when the clock's going to run out for you. You may only get on the field for one more place. So you want to make that your best. So that's what we would do, actually. If we had it in front of our mind that we could die at any moment, today may be our last day here. That's why we put ashes on. Well, then we would live differently. How would we be more kind? You would forgive anyone and everyone you can. You'd probably find a priest to go to confession if you needed that. Right? What else would you do? You would say your prayers. You'd be disciplined. You know, if you had some money in your wallet and could give it away, you would give it away. You would want to die without any money on you and try to help as many people as you can. I like the joke, you would probably tell your husband or wife your passwords to the online bill pay so they could pay the bills when you're gone. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to be, you know, they'll be screwed. They'll be in a terrible position, right? What else would you do? Would you try to get a health insurance, a life insurance policy to help your family? Who knows? Who knows, right? But you would try to live today as best you could. And that means, well, by loving God. And your neighbor, by taking time to pray, by being a better husband or wife, being a better priest. Right? This is what you would do if you had it right in your mind that you could die tonight. And that's why we put ashes on. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Oh, yeah, we're going to return and we could appear before Almighty God. And there are four things that you need to know to be saved. What are they? One. Two. Three. All right, the big one. What's the fourth? <laughs> Did you get it? The second person of the Trinity became man for us, suffered for us, died for us, and rose for us so that we might be saved.
right? We believe in him and love him. And what does that mean? It means keep the commandments, as Jesus says, right? With the help that he God gives us. And he gives us that help in the sacraments of the church. All right. So we could die at any moment. We could stand before him and that's who God is. So how are we doing? Are you doing well in the field? What kind of halftime adjustments do you need to make? And it's different for each one of us, but we as a whole team, the whole 1.3 billion Catholics in the world, not just Christians, 1.3 billion Catholics. And most of them are like you and me. We would say Roman Catholics in America, but we're technically Latin Rite Catholics. That's most of us. The whole team got together yesterday and Ash Wednesday, put ashes on our head to have it in front of our mind that we could die. And how are we doing? And then today and the rest of Lent, we're going to carry that out with the individual adjustments you and I need to make. All right. God bless you.